Hey now, today we're going to take a look at Bell of the Ball from Dice Eat Meat Games. This is a competitive game for two to five players, although with five players you have to be kind of, do some kind of wonky things with the rules, so I don't really recommend it. But the theme of this game is, it's pretty cool actually, uh, depending on the group that you're playing with, because some people are well, just not going to play a game called Bell of the Ball. But anyways, uh, <laughs> there's a, a party going on in this like weird fictional realm that the game takes place in. There's a big party, like Carnival going on, and you are each uh, sort of party leaders, I guess. You're trying to get all of your guests into the party the guests that you want to be into the party guests that share similar interests and you know uh maybe you even want to attract the attention of the the titular bell of the ball the woman who's sort of uh like i don't know if she's supposed to be like a princess or something like that who's sort of running the party who likes to just go around and sow mischief and gossip and just you know do all these things just to have fun and if you can manipulate her in the right way which sounds awful actually uh you can score more points which of course is the point of the game is to get the most points by the end try to get all of your party goers in hope that they have as many matching interests as possible really what this is is a set collection card game but with a pretty unique theme and definitely some unique artwork so let's go ahead and take a brief overview of the game then we're going to come back let you know what i think Okay, I'm going to give you a very brief overview of Bell of the Ball from Dice Hate Me Games. This is a competitive game for two to five players, although if you play with five players, you have to do some weird stuff like mixing the two center lines together in order to play. So I haven't really played it that way, but uh, I, you know, I would think that the two to four player game is the normal way to play the game. Now the theme of this game is that there's this big party going on and you're like some sort of party attendant who's trying to gather together the best guests with the most common interests in order to get your guests into the party and score points for doing so, which is a little bit weird, but let's just go with it. Now, you're also trying to gain the attention of the bell, who's like the, I don't know, the princess or something. She's the bell of the ball, and she's like got a, a lot of influence, and she might help you in scoring points and uh, having your party goers be the most influential. Now, at the beginning of the game, each player is going to get uh, three guests in order to start off their party. So your entire lineup of guests is considered to be your party, and you start off with three the start of three groups of guests. You can never have more than three groups of guests, and each group can only have four guests in them. As you gain guests, you're just going to stack them up vertically. And uh, once you have four, you're going to have to score them, which I'll get to in a moment. Now, each player is also going to start off with regret cards, which are the guest cards turned over with only this uh, the envelope side showing, which you'll just keep face down in front of you. And this is a sort of currency that you'll use throughout the game. Again, I'll get to that in a moment. You have your little scoring markers, and these cards represent scoring going from 1 to 60 and then you make the two lines of cards. You have the guest line and you have the bell card line. And the way that you set these up is that once everyone's got their starting guests and their, their regrets, you'll shuffle them up, you'll lay five of them out, and then flip the two decks over face up so that what you essentially have are a line of six cards to choose from. Now these uh, other cards off to the side here are actually little uh, variable expansion cards which we'll get to at the end. Now on your turn you're going to do three things in this order. The first thing you can do is optional and that's playing a bell card. We're going to come back to that because you can't do that on the first turn. Now the second thing you do which is mandatory and which is really the heart of the game is inviting a card. There's two types of cards that you can invite. The guest cards and the bell cards. Now let me tell you how you get those first because it works the same way. You can take the card that's furthest down the line for free. It costs you nothing, you're gonna take the card, and if it's a bell card, you're either gonna put it into your hand, or and you can have an unlimited amount of bell cards, or you take a guest from the end of the line, and you're gonna put that guest into one of your groups. Remember, you can only have a maximum of four guests in a group, so you can't put this guest into a group that's full, although that wouldn't really happen during this step, which I'll explain in a moment. Um, or if you have an empty slot, let's say that you scored a group previously and you have an empty spot for a group, you can start a new group with them instead. But let's say, for example, that you take a guest and you just put it in that group, there you go. That's how it would look. Once you remove either a bell card or a guest card, you're going to take a new one off the stack and everything slides down. So that's, you will always have six cards to choose from when it is that player's turn. 
But now if you, like you saw right there, I took a card that was further up. In order to do that, I would have to put regret cards under each card that I skipped, whether it's a bell card or a guest card. So if I wanted to take Mumblecore here on another turn, I have to put two regret cards underneath those cards, then take them, put them in my group. This slides down. Now on another turn, another player, including myself, with, that takes one of these guests would be able to also gain the regret that's underneath it, put it into my stack of regrets, and that's currency for another turn. Everything moves down and you keep going. It works the same way when you try to get cards from the bell line. Once you go through that second step of mandator mandatorily grabbing a card, then you're gonna get to scoring. You know, you only score if you have a group of four cards, or even if you have multiple groups of four cards, which could happen. Um, in that case, you're gonna score every group that you can and that you were required to do so. Now, here's how scoring works. Uh, this is a game that's all about set collection, and these all represent the different party goers. So, by the way, they have ridiculous names like <laughs> Grumbling Gristle Pinch and uh, Mumblecore Masher Fax and uh, maybe Mumbleclaw. In any event, what you're looking for, unless you're playing with advanced scoring rules, are just these symbols at the top of the card. There's a variety of different symbols here. You have, um, these are the interests that they have. So this would be, they're interested in talking about romance and beer and I guess geography. Uh, another example, here's uh, scholarly pursuits and cheese and also uh, uh, geography. Lots of different symbols. And what you're trying to do is match up those symbols between the different guests that you have in that group when you score. The more matching symbols, the more points that you get. So just randomly, let's say that this was the group I was trying to score. So you're going to look at all the common symbols that you have. So there's two shields, so those are matching, so that will be two points for scoring. You also have two cheese, those match, so that's another two points. You have three globes, so that's three points, so now we're up to seven. You have two hearts, which puts you up at nine. So, and then, oh, wow, there's a lot of points here. Just by random chance, this is a lot of points. So you have two, two cheese, that's two, four, six, eight, and then 11 points. That would be very, very uh, difficult to do, but just by random chance we did it. So that's all the points that you would score. You would immediately move your tracker up. Uh, and then these cards get discarded, and now you have an open spot in your group. Um, and remember, there's, uh, there's advanced scoring things too, and I'll get back to that later with some of the variants. Now, a lot of the other players are probably not going to let you get to that point, though, because there's some ways that they can trip you up. And those are from the bell cards. Now, if you had taken a bell card on a previous turn, step one of your turn can be to use exactly one of those bell cards. You can have as many as you want, but you can only use one per turn during the optional first step. So there's three types of bell cards. Uh, the first one are the mirth cards. So bell over here looks kind of uh, happy and content. You have that little blue symbol there, and it'll describe what you can do with this card. Now, bell cards are actually going to go into one of your open groups. They take a slot, which means you can't put her into a full group, and uh, she's going to take up a spot of the four that you have available, but she'll usually give you some sort of bonus. Like this one says, when this group scores, you gain plus two points for every beer mug in the group. So you know you want to put this, if you take this bell card, you want to aim for the beer mugs and put her into that group, because you'll get a lot of points that way. Now, there's also these Mayhem cards. Mayhem cards are a bit different than the others in that you're gonna play them and they go into the discard pile right away after you do their effect. This one says take a guest card from the top five cards in the discard deck. This counts as your invitation. Another example, the bell seems to be everywhere. Draw one, one bell card per player. Each player starting with you and continuing clockwise may take one. So these add some really dramatic, drastic effects that just go away afterwards. Some of the cards are mischief cards. These are cards that are going to go into your opponent's groups and take up a slot. This one says the bell keeps things casual. When this group scores, do not count any lords or ladies in the group. Some of the cards actually are signified, the guest cards are signified as lords or ladies. If that's the case, they will, that player will not score any points for those, which can be a serious screw you towards the amount of points that you get. But that's the kind of power that the bell cards have, and you have to decide which one that you're gonna go after. Now the game is gonna proceed this way. You're just constantly trying to grab guests or grab bell cards to screw over your opponents and 
Try to not to run out of regrets because then you'll have less options for what you can take on your turn. Trying to score as many groups as you can to get the most points that you can. The game is going to end when there are no cards left in the guest line. All the cards have come out of the deck and then all of them are gone. As soon as that player takes the last one, the game immediately ends. Even if that player had complete groups in his party, he cannot score them. The game immediately ends when that player takes that last card. And at that point, you get what's called compensatory scoring, which is you get a half a point for every card in your possession, your party, your bell cards, your regrets. A half a point for each of those scored appropriately. Whoever has the most points at that point is the winner. I skipped over some things, some of the different effects of the bell cards, but that's the basic gist of it. Now, there are some little modular cards you can put in just to add some more depth to the game. The first are the grifter cards. The grifter cards look very simple. They don't have any names or they don't belong to any specific regions or anything like that or have titles, but you can be played in two ways. You'll take them as a normal guest. They come out of the, the guest lineup. You can either put them into one of your parties and they'll count as three extra points when that group scores. It's very basic three points. Or you can flip them upside down and put them into your opponent's party. When they're upside down in your opponent's uh, group, excuse me, group, uh, they will be negative three points. So you can play them in one of two ways. You also have the Bell's Favor card. This is another variant you can choose to play with. Um, at the end of the first round, whoever takes that last turn of that round is going to gain the Bell's Favor card. You can play this just like a Bell card and it lets you take any card that you want in the Bell lineup for free. You'll immediately take that card into your hand and then I believe you will immediately play it. So it's like a free take of a bell card and a free play, but then the bell's favor card replaces that card in the lineup. And from now on, it's just another type of card you can take from the bell's lineup. Uh, it has the same effect each time you take it, but people will sort of be clamoring for it for the most part. Another couple types of variants that you have, there's a lot of them in this game, are the county and power cards. These are actually two sides of the same card. At the, if you choose to play with this variant, each player is going to be dealt out two of these cards. They will decide one card to keep face up with the county side and one card to keep face up with the power side. Now this is what the extra scoring disc the game comes with are for. For the county cards, you're going to put the scoring disc all the way over at the zero mark. And then whenever you meet a certain condition having to do with the county that these that the guests belong to, you're going to be able to move up your scoring mark. It's whenever you, uh, every time that you invite, or I'm sorry, you score a guest from the applicable county, like this one, Craw County, you're gonna be able to move your scoring disc over. And at the end of the game, wherever that scoring disc is, you'll score that many points. On the other side of the card are the power sides. This is where you're gonna start off at the maximum amount of points uh, applicable for the card and then every time you use the special power on the card you have to move your scoring marker down so you'll get less points but it's a very powerful effect that might help you score more points this one says add a guest from the top of the discard pile to any group in your party which could be huge if you play it right uh, another example when taking a card you may take one more following normal rules and I'll show you one more. Dismiss a bell card and its regrets from the line. If you don't want someone to get a certain card out there, use this, get rid of it. So very powerful effects, but it's kind of push your luck because you'll be losing points each time. So there's even some extra variants for scoring and drafting cards at the beginning that I don't think are that interesting. That's basically the game. You're trying to get sets of guests with common interests in order to score the most points by the end of the game. Let's get to my final thoughts. You know, this seems to be uh, a month for interesting themes as far as the games that I've played because we have Bell of the Ball, which is definitely a unique premise. And uh, I, I reviewed Elevenses, which was another card game that was a, even lighter than this one uh, about having a fancy tea party. And, I, you know, it's kind of interesting to me. It, Elevens has sort of had a fun reaction. I don't think anyone was really having a problem with playing it. But when I had Bell of the Ball out, and this is just touching on something I mentioned in my intro, um... There were people, like especially guys, who, in my group who were like, I, I'm not gonna play a game called Bell the Ball. It's ridiculous. There's like a Disney princess on the box. What this? I mean, but they were being serious. Like they really cared. There was even a, a friend of mine, a woman who, you know, I, I think is a pretty open-minded person who said, Wow, I mean, you really thought that people would want to play a game called Bell the Ball, huh? You know, like your guy friends. I mean, they wouldn't want to play that. I'm like, really? I don't see the problem. Who cares? I. I don't know. I just think that sometimes I thought I was in a pretty progressive group, but sometimes it just goes to show that 
I people have a long way to go towards being more open-minded about things because personally I think the theme is pretty interesting and fun I'd, I'd always prefer uh, prefer a theme of like blowing stuff up and killing dragons but <laughs> this is I always want to change the pace too so I think this and 11s is were really, really cool themes, and I'm happy to see them. So, but let's just jump right into it. Regarding that theme, you know, uh, it, it's an it's a neat theme. What this really is, is a set collection game, so you don't necessarily feel like you're inviting people to a party so much. But I will say that what goes along with helping that quite a bit, component-wise, is the artwork on the cards, which is just awesome. That's one of the first things that made me back this on Kickstarter. This was a Kickstarter game. And it, the, the art is just phenomenal. It's just, it's beautiful. I, I, the whole game and, and the graphic design as well, you know, it's, you can have nice artwork but have horrible graphic design, which is to say text that's too small, things that don't make sense, too many symbols mashed together, stuff like that. But they really knocked knock it on the park on this one really all looks really good everything's very clear everything's very succinct it looks really nice to look at on the table especially when you have different uh sets of guests in front of you the box is cool it's the same type of box they use for um uh the great heartland hauling company another game from dice hate me that i recommend um so i like that and i just think they did very very well with the components and the you know they have little scoring discs and things like that and the scoring cards which aren't necessarily the greatest but to keep it small and to keep it in that size box, they had to make some sacrifices, and I think that was great. I think it all works together really, really well. And the names on the cards are so absurdly fun and ridiculous. The very, I would say, actually the first two games of this I played, because I played my first two games with two different groups of people, most of the game was just laughing at the ridiculous names. <laughs> you know, every time a new name came out, we had to stop and laugh at it off the top of the stack of the guest line. So that's just great. My personal favorite, though, is the one called, the, the woman named Hard Cider. It's just completely counterintuitive to the rest of the game, and I love it. <laughs> so, I lo so I like the theme, I like the components, and I like all the text on the cards. Now, the gameplay. The gameplay does something, uh, one of my favorite mechanics, which I call the small world mechanic because it's the most prominent place I've seen it before, but not the only one. Ferenz does it as well. Uh, it's the concept of having a line of cards or resources, or in the you know, small world, it's races and power combos. Um, having a line and being able on your turn to take for free the thing from the very end of it but if you want something else something that you think is better or just helps your particular needs at the time you can get it but you're gonna have to pay for it and by paying for it other players may be able to take what you paid for it and return by taking one of the cards that you skipped I really like that concept I don't know it's just it works so very very well and it's a very uh, cheap but effective way to uh, add some more strategic levels to the game um, and how it works thematically in this is that you have letters of regret like I regret to inform you that you, I will not be informing you to <laughs> inviting you to the party I want that guy instead <laughs> so it's pretty cool um, I, I like that a lot I like the um, well, I'll get back to the bell cards in a minute, but I think that that whole thing with the guest line works really, really well. And it, neat things like that sort of cover up the fact, together with the artwork, that this is really just a set collection game. And it's very simple. I mean, you're trying to match up symbols, um, which means that this isn't the deepest game ever, and it's certainly very light. If you play with just the base rules, it's very easy to explain. Um, I would say, and this is one of the problems I have with the game, is that it's even though it's simple to learn it can be a bit too long for what i would deem to be a filler maybe if you're playing with the same group consistently and everyone knows exactly what they're doing and what their strategies are yes but really this is like an hour long game which just falls for me out of the range of a filler by at least a half hour um so that could be a knock against it it's in this weird sort of level between lightweight and heavyweight it's like midweight but not even quite midweight you know that kind of uh area there but it's but the but the mechanics are still simple enough that it can it doesn't feel like it's too long most of the time. Now let's talk about those bell cards. If I had to say what my number one issue with the game was, it's it would have to do with the bell cards. On the surface of it, it's a cool idea because you have different types of bell cards, they do different things. It's like a whole another optional step that you can either choose to ignore or not. But if you do ignore it, you're probably going to lose. <laughs> That's the thing, is that it, even if you have all the right guests and everything is just working out for you perfectly as far as the guests that you invite and the groups that you have, you can get totally jacked up by those bell cards 
from the other players, either because they just happen to get the most perfect combo ever with one of the uh, the mirth cards that they invite into one of their groups, or because they just totally hammer you with a mischief card that you can do nothing about. That happens quite a bit in this game, and the problem is because of the random nature of that line, there's not much you can do about it. There's not much you can do if you, you know, a great card comes out when you're not able to get <laughs> get it with your regrets, or maybe it's not a great card for you, but it is perfect for the next player and gives them a huge boost. Um, so that whole randomness of that, I don't mind the randomness of the guest line because there's always something you can do. You can start a new group if you have to at a certain point in the game. You know, you can always match them up some way, somehow. And I don't even mind the bell cards that necessarily give you points just for your groups, but those mischief cards and the random event cards, the uh, mayhem cards, <laughs> just totally can mess up the game quite a bit for someone. And, you know, especially if one player gets hammered with the majority of them which can happen. So I've seen that happen to me in both ways, where I was the player who just got the right bell cards at the right time and just decimated the other players, at least one other player, and I was on the receiving end of it in one of the next games, <laughs> probably justifiably so, but uh, where I was doing very well in the beginning and then just everyone ganged up on me and I got hammered with cards. So I don't know if that's a problem with the group or with the bell cards necessarily. I tend to think it is the bell cards. I think that they're just too random and chaotic but, but I do think that the rest of the game sort of outshines it. And I think that there are some things you can do to sort of mitigate that. I just wish they weren't as like tremendously important to get in the game, in my personal opinion. Now, there are variants that you can play. This game is somewhat modular and that there's different other little card expansions you can choose to mix in with or not. Um, the Grifter cards are very simple and I recommend just playing with them off the get-go because they're not a huge deal. They either give you three points or they take negative three points away from someone else. It's not a tremendous swing of points and they're not complicated to explain, so I would just use them. There's only like four to six of them, something like that, so it won't extend the game very long either since the game doesn't end until the guest line runs out. Um, some of the other ones are kind of hit and miss. I do like the county cards and the power cards, but I don't recommend playing with them right away because it's uh, it's it's not that complicated, but do a first game first at least. And then I would recommend playing with them because it's different options that you have. You have goals now. You're trying to get people from certain uh, counties. And then you are you have this power that you can use selectively that may or may not be that helpful, but at least it's extra points. Um, so that's a cool thing too. Some of the other extra variant rules are like involving scoring and drafting cards at the beginning and having like, you know, extra little scoring bits. I wouldn't bother with those. I think they complicate the game too much. And I think that the game is already too complicated for what it's trying to be, which is essentially a light card game. So I wouldn't bother with the draft in the beginning. I wouldn't bother with some of the extra little scoring rules, but the other cards are cool. Um, so overall, I think that this is a good game. I don't think it's fantastic, and I think it's only because of the randomness and because of the sort of the uh, the take that elements that can from the bell cards that can be a bit frustrating. But as a set collection game, it's very cool. It's very streamlined, um, very modern feeling, especially because of the gorgeous artwork um, and just the presentation. And your turns go fast, which is a very cool thing. So even if it overall the game might overstay its welcome, it doesn't necessarily feel that way all the time. Uh, so. Good game. I recommend it. Actually, I think that Dice Hate Me Games is really starting to rise up in my list because of this game and uh, the great Heartland Hauling Company. I haven't played some of their other games, but I would be eager to do so because uh, they have some really, really great ideas. They're really good at taking wonderful uh, graphic design and artwork and having uh, mechanics that are relatively simple, but that offer a surprising amount of depth in a small box. And I'm guessing that's probably their company's mission statement, and they seem to be doing it pretty well. So, bow the ball, two thumbs up. My name is Nick, this has been Board Game Brawl, and I'm reminding you to get out there and game every day in every way. Take care.